All right, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so um, I guess all of you are either scientists or interested in science, hence why you would be here. Um, and as a scientist at various times in your career, you might think, um, I want to learn programming. What programming language should I learn? Um, is that Python? Or I'm getting pretty good at Python, but some things are hard, some things are slow. Um, should I go and learn this other new language? Um, or if you're like me, you might say, oh, I'm massively invested in Python by now. How do I convince as many people as possible to buy into Python? Um, and then this came along. Um, so no, but in reality, we, we all face the question of, do I keep using what I'm using, or um, do I pivot to this new and shiny thing? Um, and so periodically, you might read some news, you know, Hacker News or Reddit or whatever, um, and, and try to figure out the answer to that question. Um, so let's start with a Google search. Um, so <laughs> they're the two questions that I'm going to try to talk about um, today. So why is it so popular, uh, and why is it so slow? Um, so for the first question, um, let's see how popular it actually is in science. Um, so a couple years ago, um, Toma Robitai um, and Chris Beaumont did an analysis of Python mentions in astronomy papers. Um, and so I took that analysis. They published it in, as a Jupyter notebook. Um, and I took that and updated it. And this is what it looks like. Um, so that's a proportion of papers mentioning each of these programming languages. And you can see Python is just really, uh, I mean, this actually beat my expectations of just how popular it was becoming. Um, and at this rate, in 10 years, 200% uh, of papers will <laughs> be using Python. <laughs> um, so the next question is, why is it so popular? Um, and um, now I'm just going to be arguing. I don't have data. Um, but I think the first reason is the community of scientific Python. And it really is um, excellent. Um, so to illustrate, um, this uh, is my first ever pull request. Uh, that's my second one. Both of those happened um, at the SciPy 2012 conference, uh, where I was um, you know, just a, a user of Python. I'd never made any open source contributions whatsoever. Uh, just you know, written various scripts for my research. Um, and when I gave a talk there, um, Stefan van der Waal, who created Scikit-Image, um, said, hey, why don't you join us? Um, and they taught me through the whole open source contribution project uh, process and so on. Um, so one of the take homes of, of um, this keynote is come to the sprints. If, don't think you're not good enough, because I definitely felt I was not good enough at the time. Um, and you just learn a lot, and, and you can contribute. Um, so the next reason for Python success that uh, I want to talk about is elegance. And you can see I have a thing about it based on my book. Um, but I think Python is popular because it's easy to write and it's easy to read. Um, and it, it, it was born as a teaching language, and I think it really shows. Um, and it has a style guide, PEP8, which is universally accepted. And so um, Python code is remarkably consistent. You can go and read some code online, and everything will be instantly familiar to you. Um, so this is, um, you know, how do you find a, a pattern in a file? Um, for line and file, if pattern, inline, yield line. You can, it, it almost reads like an English language description of what you want to do. Um, and you could really not remove anything there uh, and make it clearer, right? So it's, it's really as compact as possible while still being readable. Um, and of course, it is possible to write obtuse Python code. Um, but I think Python makes it easy to write very clear code. There's very little extraneous syntax um, that gets in the way of what you want to write. So curly braces, for example. Um, here's an example using uh, NumPy and SciPy. Um, so quantile normalization is a statistical technique to make all of your data fit a particular distribution. Um, and you can do it in three lines of um, SciPy and NumPy. So you um, sort your. Do we have a laser pointer of some description? Maybe not. All right. Um, let me see if I can get a cursor. I cannot get a cursor. All right, anyway, first line. 
Um, we're taking, uh, we're sorting our input data uh, column-wise, um, and then we take the mean across the rows. Awesome, thank you. Great. Uh, and then we take the mean across the rows of that. So that gives us the, the average quantiles of our data. Um, and then we can use from the mstats package in SciPy, uh, rank data, um, so we um, find the rank of each observation in every column. And we're done. Um, so uh, being able to produce code like this that uh, takes up very little space um, and reads clearly um, is a huge advantage in, in debugging and correctness. Um, so NASA, which produces the most bug-free code on Earth, um, has a style guide for, for code. And it's C code, but a lot of the things apply to Python. And one of them is keep uh, your functions within 60 lines of code, something that can fit on a screen. Because if you start to scroll up and down, it's very hard for us to just keep track of, of everything that's going on. Um, so it's really good that Python lets you write concise things like this. Um, so Python by itself is really good. Um, one of the um, design goals is easy things should be, uh, sorry, common things should be easy. Um, and NumPy and SciPy um, are even better, so we'll revisit that as well. Um, but Python is not the only language that can write, you can write elegant code in. Um, so here's an example from R. Um, in large part to um, Hadley with Kim's dplyr, you can, you get this uh, pipe operator and that makes writing complex analysis in very few lines of code very easy. Uh, so you can take the flights data group by the date. We're gonna select the um, arrival delays. Um, and then for each of those groups, we're gonna summarize them by the median. Um, then we're gonna sort it by date, and we're going to add uh, a date and what day of the week, and then we pipe that directly into our plot. Okay, so in just that amount of uh, code, now I've got um, date versus the um, median delay, and you can get a tremendous amount of information from your data. Um, so uh, one of the things, for example, Christmas is uh, this Tuesday here. Um, so actually flying on Christmas is not a, not a bad thing. Uh, flying on the weekends, so Saturday and Sunday, mostly stay below the zero line. Um, so that surprised me. Um, you, you can, if you, if you wanna get on time, you can fly on the weekend. Um, and similarly, these are the, the weekdays before the 4th of July and after. So um, as I said, it's, it's a lot of insight from, from very little code. Um, and there's also Haskell. Um, so this is how you define the Fibonacci sequence in Haskell, and this is just the definition of the Fibonacci sequence, uh, and yet it's also valid Haskell code, so that's um, pretty amazing. Um, and this is a little bit uh, of a slow implementation. Uh, that's the, the fast implementation. So I, I think it's not just Py Python is not the only game in town when it comes to elegance. Um, <clears throat> So if you want Python to go the distance, you have to offer more than that, right? Um, and so we also have to contend with the second part of the, the search, which is why is it so slow. Um, and this is the fact that Google autocompletes with this is actually a huge statement, although I have to say uh, a year ago when I tried this, so slow was, was actually at the top, so that's good. <laughs> Um, but it's still, it's still a big problem, right? So people are, are going on the internet and wondering why their Python code isn't fast. Um, there's a website, oh, that's cut off, sorry. Um, the slides, I'll put them up on the web so you can get all the references. Um, but yeah, there's a benchmarks website where there's a whole bunch of benchmarks and, and you can compare languages, um, implementations of, of certain problems in different languages. And you can see here, uh, Python is 100 times slower than, than C code. Um, and actually, when I ran this on my own laptop, it was 900 times slower than C code. Uh, so maybe depending on the virtual machine that they're running or whatever, uh, the C can't take full advantage of their processors. Um, but yeah, the difference is at least uh, this. Um, and so why is that? Um, so let's look at a statement like A equals five. Um, so if you did it in C, that's what it would be. You're just making an integer. There's gonna be a tiny bit of memory that 
um, this integer occupies. Um, in Python, this is what an integer object looks like. Um, and you've got a ref count, and you've got a type, and you've got the size of it, and then finally you've got the actual data in there. Um, so every time that you create an integer, you have to initialize this whole big thing, and um, all, of, all of these pointers need to go somewhere. And then every time you're working with that integer, you have to check all of this, and you have to um, modify it. Um, so this is all from a post by Jake Vanderplas um, that he did in 2014. Um, why Python is slow, and um, yeah, I highly recommend that you read it. It's, it's got a lot of insight. Um, so if you look at code like this, uh, which is very simple, uh, in C, right, these would be limited to numbers, and you would just have to add them. Um, but in Python, A and B could really be anything, right? It can be numbers, but it can also be uh, graphs, or it can be bananas, and then the function returns a bunch of bananas, or it can be a banana and an apple, and then you've got a fruit salad. Um, so, it, like Python, you know, every line of code that Python has to execute, it has to check for all these types and, and check that um, all of this can work. Um, so, one solution to this uh, for numeric computation, as probably most of you know, is uh, NumPy and SciPy. Um, so, in Python, again, this could be fruit and you get a fruit salad, or this could be soldiers and you get a battalion. Um, but NumPy can make use of the data type in my array to just sum numbers uh, in C and, and be very fast. Um, so NumPy can switch to C functions that are um, what people say close to the metal, which means it's really um, processor uh, instructions. Um, so again, a quantile normalization that we saw earlier, uh, this is actually a very fast uh, way to compute this. Um, another example, this is um, using sci-fi sparse matrices. So each of these uh, capitalized variables is a matrix. Um, and um, you can make different matrices uh, based on the row sums of things. Um, here's a degree, inverse degree matrix. Um, using this uh, sparse construct from um, SciPy. Um, and then you can do matrix arithmetic. Uh, in Python 3.5, you've got matrix multiplication operator. That's uh, one big reason to switch to Python 3.5 if you work in science. Um, and that, yeah, then you call get the eigenvectors, um, and then you do this uh, matrix multiplication, and now you've got um, spectral coordinates uh, to plot your, your graph nodes uh, in such a way as to minimize the total distance of your edges. Um, so that's, that's a pretty neat little piece of linear algebra that you can do with, with NumPy and SciPy, and it's, it's very fast. I think it's close to as fast as you can do it. Um, but of course, the problem with this is that um, it's very hard to write your own numerical routines. Um, so Python for, for science can be fast, like I, uh, code that I just showed. Um, and that's why we, we have this massive growth, because for, for standard things, you've got <laughs> libraries that you see and um, can make things fast. Um, but it's very hard to write your own numerical routines. Python is fast um, by hiding the messy C code uh, that we all rely on and having only Python code um, do some kind of glue of, of these routines. And it's very hard to derive, uh, <clears throat> sorry, to implement your own algorithms from this. Um, so things like graphs are always going to be slow uh, unless you have some graph C graph library that you pipe into. Um, and that, that was, I was pessimistic. You can, if you look at my blog a year ago, I was kind of down on, on a lot of stuff in Python. Um, but but there's, there's definitely new developments um, that mean I'm really optimistic now again. Um, so the first one um, is Cython, which just keeps getting better and better. So it's actually very, very easy to A, turn your, your Python code into C, and B, uh, wrap C code um, that is pre-existing. If someone's got a C library that does what you want, it's very easy to use Cython to import that C library into Python. Um, so here's a numerical routine in Python. Um, so you're just taking a function, and then you're integrating that using um, I don't actually know the name of this algorithm. Um, 
And so here is what the equivalent Cython code looks like. Um, so all you're doing, I've, I've highlighted in red, um, is adding a bit of type information to your, to your functions. Um, so this function you, you don't want to use from Python itself. You just want to use um, in C. And so you just see def instead of def. And then you say, I'm going to return a double, and I'm going to take a double, and then some variables inside I also declare. Um, and similarly, um, in here, you use def, which means you can call this from Python. Um, but inside of the function, it's all going to be C, um, and it'll be fast. By the way, if I'm going too fast or anything, feel free to interrupt me. Um, OK, so this is really great. And you can also call in, you can import. Instead of include, you use import like you would in, um, sorry, you would use C import. And then you import a C library. And, and Cython does all of the um, type conversion for you. So it'll take collections and turn them into lists. It'll take uh, arrays and turn them into lists, and so on. Um, the only problem with Cython is that it, it, it is a bit harder to develop in, um, because now you've got two compilation steps. There is This gets turned into C, and then the C has to be compiled. And you lose quite a bit of the niceness of Python. Um, so is it hopeless? Um, well, it's not. So I, I said this is actually what um, an integer looks like in, in C Python code. Um, but actually, there is literally nothing in the Python language specification that says that this is how it has to be implemented. Right? This is just an implementation detail of how Python um, was historically developed. Um, and you, many of you might have heard of Julia, uh, which is a language that looks a lot like Python. So this is a, a Julia uh, program um, to solve quadratic equations. And um, except for these ugly ends that I despise. Um, it's, it's, it looks very much like Python. And yet, Julia is very performant. Um, it, it, it's very fast. Um, and how does it achieve that? Um, it uses something called just-in-time compilation. Um, so I'm going to use a function to illustrate what that is. And by the way, I'm like a total amateur at, at this, and I, I don't understand any details of it. But, but on a high level, um, what's happening is you've got this Python function. And uh, as I said, Python doesn't know what the types of A and B are. Uh, so it doesn't know what to do. Every time that it calls a function, you have to check the types of the arguments and so on. Um, do some, some hard work, basically, to, to make sure that, that you're doing the same things here. Um, but with just-in-time compilation, you're actually looking at the code as it executes. And you, you know, normally, you're just going to call this with two float, or arrays of floats. And so all, the compiler just needs to know, all right, I've called it with two arrays of floats. OK, when, when these are two arrays of floats, this is going to be an integer. This is going to be a float, because it gets added to a float down here. Um, and this is just going to be an iteration. And finally, we're going to take the square root of that and return another float. So if you introspect the code as it's executing, um, you can then produce a function that looks like the Cython function that I talk, uh, told you about before. Um, and um, yeah, has information about the types and runs very quickly. And so you put that aside, and, um, and you make a note of it. And then the next time that you get called this function on two arrays of floats, you're like, ah, I've got this function that I've compiled that's super fast. I'm going to use that instead of using the Python code. Except when you call it with two bananas, then it just drops back into the Python code. So um, that's, that's a really high level view of what JITs do. Um, and there's, there's quite a few examples. So you might have heard of PyPy. Um, there's also Numba and Piston. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's what you're doing. So if we go back to uh, this function uh, that I did before, um, I tried this yesterday. And all I do is import number, add number JIT, and number JIT. This is actually um, 600 times faster than this. Um, so very little effort. Um, all you need to do is make sure that all of your um, values are numerical or numerical arrays. And Numba just, yeah, can be a, a miracle worker. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, are we done? Um, and the answer is no. 
Um, so, so two years ago, I tried Number and I couldn't get it to do what I did, what I wanted. And even now, it's still a bit fiddly because um, sometimes no Python means okay. If you can't jit this, then then give me an exception, um, and it'll fail, and you won't really understand why it's failing. Um, so, so it's still hard to a bit hard to work with. Um, and there's also a little bit of a um, I don't want to say dirty secret, but it is. <laughs> uh, it's not well known. So, so Numba can, can take this uh, np.square root call and, and work with it. Uh, but in general, C functions, things that are developed in C, uh, just-in-time compilers can't touch because it's just this black box binary that, that you know, takes an input and produces an output. Um, and so all of the JITs don't actually work with the NumPy compiled C functions. Um, and even though number does, whenever you have an np dot something call, number will just work with it. Um, the secret is that number number just re-implemented a lot of this, the the numpy functions themselves, um, and and work with that. And so that's uh, and this is true also of PyPy, um, and and a bunch of others. Um, and that's because, as I said, it's hard to to work with C code, and um, Yeah, and, and so they, they re-implement it. It's a bad thing because now if NumPy evolves, then they're out of step. Um, so that there's, a, for example, if you have numpy.sum, you can pass it an access argument. Um, if you do that inside number, number will fail. Um, so be, and that's because they have their own, their own implementation of things. Number also doesn't have uh, numpy.arg sort, for example. Um, so this is really not a good state of affairs. Um, and, but what's the solution? Um, and so you can go back to this 2012 blog post, which is not going to appear, but again, my, I'll put my notes uh, on Twitter. Um, it's by Jake van der Plaas, um, and it's in 2012, which is remarkably uh, prescient, but um, he talks about the future. He, he talks kind of the way I'm talking about it, and he, he, it's called Why Python is the Last Language You'll Ever Need to Learn. Um, so one of the things that you might not know about NumPy is that it didn't just happen. Um, there were two competing array libraries um, in the early 2000s, NumArray uh, and Numeric, um, and, and they were kind of stepping on each other's toes, and, and the community was split. Um, and Travis Oliphant came and basically produced NumPy, which took um, all of the best code from both of those libraries, um, and coordinated the community effort to ev have everyone migrate to NumPy. Um, and now NumPy, of course, uh, underpins all of scientific computing in Python. Um, so, so that was a f just a fantastic effort. Um, and so Jake argues that this is going to happen with just-in-time compilation as well. Um, and now, four years later, um, I think we're really starting to see this happen. Um, so uh, he said there will be another Travis Elephant, who is uh, the person who unified NumPy. Um, and so maybe that person could be uh, Nathaniel Smith, who is a core developer of NumPy. And um, in SciPy 2016, um, which I went to a, couple, a month ago or so, um, organized the Python compilers uh, workshop where they're coming up with solutions to provide NumPy, have NumPy provide an intermediate representation of its algorithms so that uh, just-in-time compilers, instead of having to look uh, into a C black box binary, uh, can look at this intermediate representation and just do that. Um, so, so, and basically all of the uh, just time are on board with this plan. Um, another possible solution, um, very exciting, I recommend you, you see this talk, it's uh, Brett Cannon, who is a C core developer, and Dino Vland. Uh, they're both at Microsoft. Um, and they've developed this thing called Pigeon, which is another, yet another just-in-time compiler, um, but it's actually very different in spirit to the others. Um, and the reason is very different is that in addition to the just-in-time compiler that they've pr produced, um, they've produced a plug-in plug system for um, C Python, so the main Python implementation, that would allow people to very easily um, provide just-in-time compilers. Um, and this might make it into the, the C Python spec. So then what that could trigger is lots and lots of just-in-time compilers competing with each other for speed, kind of an arms race. Um, and you're going to end up with, A, a system that can use any of these very, um, and B, all of these improving very quickly. Um, 
and demonstrating the flexibility of the system, they actually uh, were able to just the way Pigeon works uh, is is quite different from um, Numba, and uh, they got 100% compatibility with NumPy uh, straight away. Um, so that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, unfortunately, currently you can only run Pigeon on on Windows, but that's not by design. That just because they work at Microsoft and that's how they've developed it. But there's nothing about this um, that is Windows only, um, and they, they address that in the in the talk. Um, so yeah, th this is this is definitely a cause for for optimism. I think. Um, so I've got these three take homes about Python um, Python and science. The first one is the community. Uh, so definitely. Uh, one of the things that I didn't say is um, with Number, uh, some of the work that I was doing uh, preparing for this talk, um, I couldn't really quite get it to speed things up. Um, I wrote to the mailing list uh, less than a day. Um, I had a response back that, that basically solved all the problems. So the community in SciPy is really fantastic. If you're having trouble, uh, go to the mailing list. Um, people will help you out. Um, definitely come to the sprints. Uh, I'm going to be around on Monday. Uh, not sure what I'm probably working on some number porting. Um, um, and yeah, happy to help out. Um, then yeah, elegance, as I said, you can you can really write good code. Um, small plug for my book, but um, yeah, there's there's just a lot of amazing code uh, and amazing analysis you can do with just SciPy um, and combining all of the different functions in SciPy. Uh, and performance, as I said, um, it's only getting better. Um, and there's lots and lots of really smart people working to make your Python code faster. Um, so with very little work from you, suddenly like all of Python is going to become much faster. And I think that's amazing. Um, and as a bonus, I'm just going to plug Python 3.5. <laughs> just it, it's ready. Switch to it. It's really nice. Um, and uh, especially for scientific computing, uh, now with the uh, at um, matrix multiplication operator, it just makes things so much nicer. Um, and with that, I'll open for questions. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I wasn't familiar with R having that piping operator, but it seems like a very cool idea. In Python, this is just a syntactic question almost, it seems you either have to go with massive chains of intermediate variables or monster nested expressions. Is there any advice you have for like big data flows like that? Uh, I have a, a talk uh, at last year's year sci-fi about tools, tools with a Z. Uh, it is an awesome library that provides just that. No. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? So thanks, uh, Juan. That was a great talk. Uh, I just have a question about your book and your talk about optimization. I notice in the early release you haven't finished that part. Is that uh, is that related to uh, some of the advances in optimization? Sorry, okay, can you repeat that? I, I can... uh, just a, a question about your book. Uh, the early release has uh, the optimization section not quite complete. Is oh, that something? Too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it'll come. Um, <laughs> so so it, it just, it, that's definitely something that we want to cover. Uh, the SciPy uh, library has an optimized package with lots of awesome function optimization uh, algorithms. So it, it's not about taking your code and speeding it up, if that's your question. It's about using the functional optimization uh, Submodule in SciPy. Um, if you want, which one were you talking about? Uh, more about speeding up your code. Oh, okay. Uh, so there, there's a bunch of uh, other Python books uh, that that cover this. Um, I think effective computation physics might have a chapter on this. Have a look at the the TOC. There, there's there's a bunch of um, 
yeah, scientific Python books that have come out in the past couple of years that, that cover exactly this uh, in, in great detail. Also, um, High Performance Python, I think it's called, by Ian Oswald. Great book. Yep. Hi. So I've become delightfully and happily spoiled by the, the friendliness of Python. I love the IPython REPL and PDB and largely readable stack traces with exceptions and all that sort of stuff. If I was to head off into the wonderful world of, of this sort of embedded C code and even the CDEFing functions that you, that you demonstrated, do I lose out on much of that? Do I get to keep the beautiful IPython REPL PDB or do, is it, do I start looking at segmentation faults instead? Uh, so Cython by default uh, will not give you a segmentation fault. It has bounce checks and all of these nice things and exception throwing. But you can turn those off if you know that this is a super solid piece of code and you, yeah. And get a little bit more performance. Right? Yes. Uh, I, for, for the JITs, I, I have no idea. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that Cython had two purposes, one of which was speeding up existing Python code and the other which was like wrapping C. So I can see the speeding up existing Python code could go away if the JITs work mm. as well as they should. Um, but the wrapping part um, is still something that I, I think is, is valuable. I mean, sure. uh, and uh, there was something called SWIG as well. And also Cython wraps C plus plus as well as just C. Okay. So in a nutshell, where do you think that's going at the moment? Uh, I think Cython, I, I think Cython definitely supersedes things like Swig and Boost Python. Uh, it's, uh, in my experience, a lot easier to work with. And um, it'll keep up to date with the Python 2, Python 3 thing. Um, unlike Swig and Boost Python, you don't have to write different things for the two different um, versions of, of Python. Um, so yeah, Cython's not going away, uh, and, and it's awesome. Um, the, the link that I had there that was cut off, um, um, and again, which I'll post, um, has a Cython tutorial where you, you do all of the speeding up and the wrapping and the profiling. Cython has a very nice um, way to tell you where your code is not being sped up by Cython, uh, just by showing how many lines of C code are generated by every line of Cython code. Uh, so it, it's very fast to iterate and, and improve your, your site on code. Yeah. So often when I complain that my code is really slow in my academic environment, people say, oh, we'll just run it on the cluster. And that's really hard in yeah. Python. And so I was wondering if the, the JITs are going to make that kind of not be an issue. I mean, maybe probably not for most things, but um, can you implement that sort of multi-threaded cluster environment stuff within Cython and how that work, or is that, have you, do you have any experience with that? Uh, I have some experience with it. Uh, that is also getting just amazingly better. Um, there's another talk that I could have given, which is on Dask, uh, which is by Matt Rock, developed tools that I mentioned before. Um, and it is an amazing library. Um, and again, it's only getting better. They just got this enormous grant to make it um, sort of work in all different kind of clusters, environments. It already works with Slurm. Um, yeah, and, and it's a task, like a task, but with a D. Um, yeah, and, and it, it, it does, does really great. Um, NumBy itself has uh, primitives for multi-threading and so on. Uh, Cython, you can turn off the gil in your Cython code. Uh, there's definitely lots of options. I actually, I used to be of the just running on the cluster um, persuasion. Now I'm kind of annoyed when I realize that my processor is just spending time checking things that it doesn't need to check. Um, so, so I'm very much of the um, idea that you should make sure that your code is as fast as it can be, and then you run it on the cluster. But otherwise, you're just wasting people's electricity. <laughs> but yeah, the, the cluster thing is getting better and better as well. Juan. Yeah. Um, excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, often, you know, people go ahead and say, oh, let's use some just-in-time compiler or something like that. Um, 
at the best of times, I think I'm a terrible programmer. Uh, would you have any advice about premature optimization? You know, like instead of trying to optimize something with JIT or something like that, just go ahead and redesign your algorithm, use a different data structure, stuff like that. So, I mean, right now with, with the JITs, you have to go and use a different data structure anyway, uh, because uh, they all work on NumPy arrays and that sort of stuff. Um, in, for example, PyPy, which is more flexible and it really targets pure Python, uh, will let you work with dictionaries, but your dictionary should have a homogeneous type. Um, so, so it really, you do need to, to clean up your code to get, get the most out of the JITs. Um, I, sorry, what was the second part of your question? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you should, I, oh, that's right, premature optimization. So apparently that's a huge, there's a great article online, Stop Misquoting Donald Muth on Premature Optimization. And if you look at the, the, the article where he wrote that, he then goes on to say, but you should definitely optimize your code and, and, and so on. And um, I think if you, if you don't worry about it um, from relatively early on, you can end up with design choices um, that will haunt you for a very long time. And, and I've definitely experienced this. I have this code that is, I keep speeding up and speeding up, but because I started with such bad data structures, um, it's, it's becoming really, really hard to refactor. So, so definitely think about the speed of your code uh, from the beginning. Um, and wherever you can fit stuff into arrays, do it because it, it makes things a lot, a lot easier. One, one aspect of optimization, optimization that I hadn't um, quite grasped how important it is, is it's a lot easier to do operations on things that are next to each other in memory than it is to just grab this integer, grab this integer, grab this integer. It's about 100 times faster. Um, so um, thinking about stuff in arrays is a, is a huge advantage. Do we have more questions? Uh, Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, just while I think of it, um, I've got a feeling there might be a talk on Dasks given by someone else at the conference, just from memory. I hope I'm not wrong there. It was last year. I'm not sure that was. Okay. Um, so we've got you know NumPy and the various SciPy things, which is really someone smart's gone and written C code, Fortran code, and then I can use it with this nice Python interface. If a couple of years down the the road these JIT, JIT and other things are much more um, uh, mature and someone maybe has won the race. Is that going to mean that the people in Scikit-Image and NumPy then do most of their stuff in Python with a little bit of core stuff in, in, in the other languages or we're always going to live in this polyglot language world? Um, I think abandoning Cython and C uh, it's going to take a very long time um, because uh, backwards compatibility as well is very, very important um, for library developers. So you want to keep uh, supporting things like Python 2.7 and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so I think that'll, that'll last a long time. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, we're definitely, at Scikit-Image at least, uh, you know, we're always exploring all of these JIT options and whatever. But for example, we number, unless you're doing Anaconda, uh, it's quite tricky to install. Uh, so in scikit-image, uh, definitely in scikit-learn, we won't take off on dependencies that will require compilation by the user. Um, so Numba now only recently got the ability to pre-compile your uh, functions, and then you ship kind of like a C binary um, with, with your package. Um, so that's the sort of solutions that we would look at um, in, in scikit-image in the, in the near term. In the, in the long term, maybe let's say Python 4, 10 years, um, it could be that everything will be written in Python and, and super quick. Don't know yet. Do we have more questions? I've got one. Um, I've got the microphone, so why not? Um, when we look at the JITs and a number of the other Python implementations, one of the ways that they achieve their speed up is by actually defining types. If we have a look at what the Python or the C Python community is doing is they're moving towards type annotations and there was a PEP this week co-authored by Guido 
of actually more explicitly structuring those type annotations in CPython. There are quite different ways of doing that. Do you think that the community will end up being forced to adopt the CPython approach for type annotations, or we'll see this ongoing fragmentation with different tools doing it different ways, and people just having to wear the cognitive overload of different tools different ways? Um, my hope is that the community will um, make use of the, the CPython type annotations. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, they're optional, but um, so they're also optional for JITs, um, and so um, yeah, why not? Why not use them? I, th I think they're, it's a nice syntax um, and it's a very flexible framework. Uh, so I would I would say if if it were up to me, mm -hmm. we would we would eventually coalesce onto onto one thing. I don't I don't know if Cython can do that, um, but yeah. definitely for the JITs, I think it's it's a strong possibility. Any other questions? Um, great talk. Uh, I just have a question about um, using GPUs for high performance computing. Um, it seems like it's, it's a hell of a undertaking to install CUDA and get the right drivers. So is there any sort of plan to neaten that up and make it a little easier? Uh, yeah, you're, you're definitely far outside my comfort zone. Um, but I do know that Number does offer us some, some GPU compilation uh, options for certain kinds of functions. Um, so there's definitely a direction uh, of some JITs to allow kind of transparent GPU computations. Um, and, and I think that that's a strong possibility. Yeah. It, there's, there's definitely a big community to, to try to make that easier. Um, NVIDIA being, you know, the prime sort of proponents of this thing, but so they're, they're sponsoring a lot of efforts uh, to do that. Unless there's any Bernie, oh, we have a Bernie question. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk, Juan. Um, slightly off topic, but what's on the list for Scikit Image? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're kind of nearing a 1.0, which would mean um, cleaning up a lot of the inconsistencies, you know, that creep up uh, through historical, um, you know, for historical reasons. Um, and the next thing actually does include things like uh, just-in-time and, and GPU and, and basically offering a, a lot higher performance. Um, everyone in the scikit-image team, I don't know about everyone, but a lot of people in the scikit-image team used to feel like whatever is, it's C, it's fast enough. Um, but now it's actually become apparent that there's a lot of inefficiencies there where um, so I just, I just cleaned up Hessian filters um, a, a month or two ago, um, and it was a very naive implementation, and with very little effort, we got um, I think it was 17 fold speed up. Um, so I think there's a lot of lo low hanging fruit like that, uh, where we want to make scikit image really the go to for, for image analysis. Can we have a big show of thanks to Juan for the keynote and for all of the QA?